Hello and welcome to the Athletic FC podcast with me, Ayo Akinwalere. Coming up, an agreement has been reached for the Friedkin Group to complete a takeover of Everton. But when will it actually be completed and how is it being paid for? Joining me today, we have the Athletics' Matt Slater and our Everton writer, Paddy Boyland. And a little later on, we'll be joined by James Horncastle, who covers Italian football for us. Matt, let's start with you. I mean, dare I say, uh, uh, we've brought you on for a little bit of good news. Uh, could you just fill us in on what's happened with Everton this week? Well, I mean, you, you've you've outlined it already. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of good news. This is great news for, for Everton fans, long-suffering Everton fans. Um, yeah, a lot's happened. So I'm going to start by addressing something that uh, my fans on X, my, among the Everton fan base, keep keep raising. Uh, I think it was 22 days ago. It was only three and a bit weeks ago. We did a we did a post summer chat about what's going on with the Everton takeover, and I rang around and I said on this podcast that nothing was happening, which was exactly the truth. Mm. Nothing was happening. Now. About a week later, about eight, nine days later, John Texter resurfaced and stuff started happening. And then uh, whether John Texter's renewed interest in trying to do a deal with Farhad Mashuri or just the freaking group having a bit longer to think about it, having a bit longer to go through their legal issues, which is the reason they pulled out of talks with Farhad Mashuri in mid-July, whether that time, whether those conversations with their lawyers and with the other creditors, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into, mm. they got the answers they needed. A lot's happened over the weekend. I'm told this deal was done in four days. It was pretty much signed, sealed, well, not quite delivered, on Sunday night. We got to all hear about it on Monday. The club confirmed it. We did wonder. Lots and lots, lots of talk over the weekend that sort of things were moving fast if we were going to get an announcement about another period of exclusivity or sort of a kind of a positive message about kind of talks have resumed, but no, no, we got deals done. Handshakes. We've got, you know, Dan Freakin's group is going to buy Firehead Machinery's 94%. So that's it. So now it goes for regulatory approval. We've been through this process before, of course, with triple seven has to be approved by the FA and the financial conduct authority. Those two, Bits of the process are pretty straightforward. It's kind of box ticking stuff to see about your suitability to do business here. Uh, the big one is the Premier League. But this mm. should not be a big hurdle for the freaking group at all. This will not be a triple seven um, uh, type exercise at all where we wait months and months and months. I think it was nine months in the end. And they end up setting, you know, freaking some sort of impossible obstacles. No, no, he's going to be absolutely fine. He's got the money. Um, he's already passed regulatory approval processes, of course, in, in Italy, where he owns AS Roma, and France, where he owns Cannes. Um, wealthy guy, uh, real track record of success in business. Um, he's a relatively recognised figure in football now. He's only been involved at Roma since about 2020, I believe, but he's on the European Club Association board. Uh, Roma sort of sit on various club committees. Mm. They've had European success. I was looking, of course, they won. Uh, European Trophy, uh, the Conference League a couple of years ago, but they lost in the final of the Europa League. They've made four semi-finals in a row in Europe. They've got the fifth best coefficient. So whilst they haven't had that much success in, in Italy yet, they've been very consistent performers in Europe. I'm sure, again, we'll get into a bit more on that. So look, this is going to be all right. I think this will be uh, about as quick as the Premier League can do this. Eight, ten weeks. I'm pretty sure they'll be in place, place comfortably before Christmas and, of course, then before the January transfer window. So this is good news. I'm smiling. Everton fans are clearly <laughs> delighted. We can all be upbeat and positive on this podcast. Okay, Matt smiling. Paddy, I'm hoping you're smiling. Um, you just dropped a piece on The Athletic actually on this takeover. And I was reading uh, one of the comments uh, on your piece. Um, this one's from Jesse C saying, hope and hopefully relief. Everton have drained every iota of emotion out of us and we are tired. We truly need good news stories. Even journalists do occasionally. First and foremost, how are you? And also, how are some <laughs> of the Everton fans you're speaking to feeling about all of this? Yeah, I think relief is the, is the first emotion because the club has been in limbo now for, for the best part of two years as, as Farhad Mashiri has looked to sell. There have obviously been some very high profile near misses here, particularly with the 777 partners and their botched takeover bid. 
but it feels like we've just about got the the outcome everybody wanted here and i think that goes for the fans and certainly that goes for for people inside the club that i've i've spoken to um we go back to that period of stasis that kind of two year long period where Mashiri's looked for a way out and up to now hadn't been able to find one and what that basically meant was that there was a plague of uncertainty around the club key decisions around personnel and everything else have more or less been left on hold uh, at most times and I think it's just started to drain everybody that that feeling that there's seemingly not a way out of the maelstrom that they've not been able to get clear of relegation trouble relegation battles have persisted mm -hmm. whenever they've looked like they're ready to mount a recovery themselves something like PSR has pulled them back in and I think that uncertainty at the top has, has created this chaos underneath and and, and the, the turbulence and, and just a I think at the end of the day just a real fatigue with Everton's predicament and I, I sense that inside the club as well by the way even down to sometimes how Sean Dice speaks or when players they're talking to us afterwards in the mix zone how they sum up the situation so I am hoping, and I'm sure most Everton fans are hoping, that this is going to be the positive catalyst, the good news story that the club has, has, has needed and, and craved even for, for some time. And that, that certainly seems to, to, to be the mood music at the moment. Yeah. Um, Matt, you, you talked about the Freed King group um, earlier, and I'm just fascinated as to why they, they've come back so quickly. From my understanding, they've loaned Everton some money, so they've got some money in Everton already. Um, but not too long ago, they said they weren't interested. Um, is it just a texter thing? I mean, because he's of, because of his involvement, has it got them thinking, well, maybe there's an asset here? I mean, Everton still have a stadium to build. There, there's there's potential here. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a few bits to, to go at there. So uh, you're right, um, post-777 implosion, um, the freaking group came forward. Um, they've been looking at clubs for a while. They, um, I don't think this is particularly widely known, but I'm, I'm happy to reveal it here. They, mm. they looked at the minority stake at West Ham, for example. Um, you know, they, um, they, they clearly have, like a lot of these big US investors, plans around multi-club. Again, there's more to be said on this because everyone has a slightly different approach to multi-club. It does appear that the Freakins are quite happy to leave their clubs relatively independent and not tie them all together, uh, which is contrary to the John Texter approach where it very much is a pledge, you know, trading driven model. And he does sort of have a clear hierarchy in mind and he's trying to funnel players sort of up his own personal pyramid you know, using shop windows and what have you to to get as much value for the players as possible. I think I think the Freakins will 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 leave Roma and Everton as separately as separate as they can. There might be some decisions to to make later on uh, if all goes well at Everton. But so they 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 appeared on the scene kind of a little bit out of the blue because whilst people were talking about them as quietly as a sort of potential Premier League um, owner. There's there's quite a few clubs for sale at the moment. So um, it was it was quite interesting that it was Everton, but they clearly saw the things that we have talked about on this pod that Paddy writes about every week, the fan base, the history, the uh, finishing stadium, Bramley Moor. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot to like. After about a month of talks with Farhad Mashiri, they got very concerned about two things. Mm. One is this quite complicated legal case in the US to do with 777. So when they basically went bust, they're not quite bust yet. Um, their big lender, an insurance firm called ACAP, basically took all their assets. Um, so that's, that's a sort of a little wrinkle there to kind of sort out. And then um, it turns out that both 777 and ACAP are being sued by another potential creditor called Leaden Hall, which is a London-based investment firm. They've been owed hundreds of millions by by triple seven and a cap so there's a row going on there's a there's a dispute it's ongoing um you can find all the paperwork we've written about it there's some quite big allegations made by leadenhall so that's all going to be sorted out now leadenhall have an injunction which means that a cap can't really do anything can't sell anything can't can't realize any triple seven assets that it's 
that it's taken control of without running it past the court first. It doesn't mean that they can't do it. It just means they need court permission. So that's quite important. Now, sorting out the 777 loan, which is about 200 million to Everton, that was accrued over that nine month period where 777 were in the box seat. Is is any any new owner, anyone that wants to buy Everton, sort of would, would want to sort of sort that out, right? How do I deal with that? It's quite high interest. You know, I, I'm just not happy about that anyway. I need to, I need to, I'd like to knock them down a little bit. Mm. Who am I talking to? What's the potential risk of litigation going forward? In July, they just decided it was too complicated. I think they also had a secondary legal risk, and that is something that kept coming up in the previous year, 18 months, whenever I spoke to particularly American investors, you know, what have you looked at Everton? Have you thought about Everton? They'd say, yeah, of course we have. We're a little bit worried though about Farhad Mashiri and his relationship with Alisha Rizmanov, who is of course a very, very wealthy man. He's an oligarch, but he's sanctioned. And his companies sponsored Everton, to, you know, very, very generously for much of the Mashiri era. Um, and when he was sanctioned, that money was turned off and Everton started mm. to, you know, lose, lose, large sums of money. So there have been a little bit of concern around Mashiri and Usmanov because they go back a long way. I think that one has been, you know, resolved fairly comfortably. It, it, you know, it's about your appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. I think I think Freakin's lawyers have clearly decided we're okay with that risk. The key one was the ACAP loan and they've done a deal. Now that deal does, as I said, have to be presented to that court in New York. There's real confidence, I think, on the ACAP side and certainly on the freak inside, that Leaden Hall are going to go, yeah, fair enough. The court's going to go, fair enough. Mm -hmm. And it is a bit complicated. So it's 200 million pounds. Um, ACAP want cash, need cash. Uh, there was this idea, I think, floated last week that they might convert the 200 to equity. I become a minority partner at Everton. They can't do that. They'll be sued in four or five years' time. And also Leaden Hall will say, no way, we need cash. So I think the Freakins have basically decided to pay a large some of that 200 million off straight away. I think it'll be about half. And then they'll convert the rest into slightly more flexible debt. It's called payment in kind notes. Um, a bit too technical for us today, but <laughs> it, it just gives you a little bit more flexibility about when and you pay them back. Um, so that's what changed. Now, in the as you say, in the time being, Texter came along and was running around trying to sort of buy the club. I think he did have some quite interesting people that were willing to back him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he just had too many hurdles. His his whole situation was way too complicated. So I think he's just sort of thought, well, I'm sort of in. I might as well do this, particularly with January mm -hmm. coming up and the, the possible need, I think, to spend some money in January to ensure Everton remain a Premier League club, I think it was sort of now. Now's the time, you know. We're, we're, we're sort of, you know, we're poised. Let, let, let's let's crack on and do this. So I think all of those things changed their mind, basically, and that's why we got to this week. Okay, well, when it comes to football, um be nice to find out a bit more about how, you know, the Fried King group go about their business. And we've brought in uh, James Horncastle here who covers Italian football for us. And James, obviously, um, it's been... In the news this week, Roma, Fried King Group, De Rossi. Um, could you just give us a, a a glimpse as to how their takeover of Roma has gone and actually what they've done for the club? Yeah, Ayo, they were perhaps the most popular owners in Italy until about nine months ago. And I think that's because they didn't really act like American owners. Uh, and that was very well received. You know, I think they perhaps think that the image of themselves is we are Americans, you know, we've invested in data analytics, all this kind of stuff. We've got these foreign executives who aren't part of this kind of small Italian uh, old boys club school. Um, and, you know, they, they came into the club when it was COVID. Uh, they did similar thing to what we've seen at Everton, which is come in for the club, go away, come back again. Um, and they took over from a guy called Jim Palotta, did a very big interview with Jim uh, a few weeks ago, on the, a few years ago on The Athletic. I should go, yeah, go and have a look at that. Jim had become very unpopular because, you know, he kind of took financial fair play very seriously, which meant buying low, selling high. It meant play, it meant the fans couldn't get attached to any of the star players because they were off. You know, Alisson, Salah, sell them to Liverpool, make a big profit on them. You know, he was um, fixated on building a stadium because by building a stadium, you could lift the revenues. 
and then you don't have to sell your best players anymore. Mm-hmm. But that message did not cut through to the fans. And in the meantime, you've got a 40-year-old Francesco Totti who wants to keep on playing, and they're like, mate, it's time to retire. Um, and all that meant he was very unpopular. And so when the Friedkins came in, they were welcomed. You know, a red carpet rolled out uh, for them. And as I say, you know, the the first move that they make at the end of their first season is get rid of Paolo Fonseca, the coach they inherited, and out of nowhere, hire Jose Mourinho. And, um, you know, I remember Roma's former general manager, Monchi, who was disastrous. Um, Monchi said that, you know, working in Italy, it's like working in front of a shop window. Everyone sees everything. They know everything. But no one knew the Freakins were going for Mourinho, right? It kind of shows how tight their circle is. And that was like a bomb going off in Rome. It was like, wow, look at these guys. Look at their ambition. This is unbelievable. Jose Mourinho is coming to work for Roma. Um, And, you know, Mourinho had none of the baggage that he has in the Premier League. You know, Roma fans didn't care. They'd been sacked by Spurs, sacked by Man United. He was the last guy to win a European trophy in Italy. He was the last guy and the only guy to win a treble in Italy. Mm. So they've hired this guy. And in his first summer, they spend 120 million net on rubbish players. <laughs> you know, one's like this Uzbek striker, Eldor Shamurodov, who is back at the club after being sent on loan to Spezia Cagliari. Another guy, fullback from Brazil, I think he's back in Brazil. Mm. They signed Tammy Abraham. Tammy did well in his first year, not so good in his second year. Then did his knee. He's now been sent on loan for nothing to AC Milan. Um, but it was a show of ambition. And it kind of flew in the face of what Palotta had done, which was like, I'm taking financial fair play seriously. The the Freakins, they spent all of this money and then their way of kind of getting around financial fair play was to just sell off all the young players coming through the academy. Um, and this became a bone of contention for Jose um, because Jose was like, hang on a minute. He, Jose had amnesia because he forgot how much money they spent in the first summer. And then he'd be like, you've only spent 7 million net this summer and 9 million net now? Like, how can you expect me to get in the Champions League? And that's the thing. For three years, they finish sixth every year. And this was covered up by the fact that they were doing well in Europe. They won a competition that didn't exist when Pelotta was the owner, the (laughs) Conference League, which was considered beneath Roma uh, at that time. But... The fans didn't care about that. They just wanted something to celebrate, a trophy, first trophy in 14 years. Thank you, Dan and Ryan Freakin. You understand us. You understand our club. That's amazing. Second year, Europa League semi-final. Wow. Uh, Europa League final. They lose on penalties to Sevilla because mm. everyone loses to Sevilla in, in, in Europa League finals. Brilliant. Um, but within the club at this time, as much as the fans are celebrating them and the Stadio Olimpico is selling out over and over and over again, the freakings are like, hang on a minute, we've we've spent close to a billion on this club. We've got the third highest wage bill in the league. We've got Jose Mourinho as a coach, and we're not getting anywhere near qualifying for Champions League. You know, this is this is bad. Um, and it gets to January last year. They sack Mourinho. Should have sacked him earlier. And they've got a problem because over the course of two and a half years, Jose has got full imperator status in the Eternal City, um, which is, you know, as was the case when Francesco Totti was at the club, it's, yeah, people associate Roma with him, not with anybody else. So if you sack him, it's it's like you're denigrating the club. Mm-hmm. And so the only way to get around that was to appoint a bona fide club legend, Daniel De Rossi, um, as initially as a caretaker manager to keep the fans on board. He did very well to start off with, um, so well that they prematurely gave him a permanent contract for three years, and they've just gone and spent $100 in the summer uh, in a transfer window, which was very strange because, you know, they they spent all this money and there are people looking at this and going, you're under a financial fair play settlement agreement here. Um, How are you doing this? You know, they've just been fined $2 million by UEFA for bringing breach last year. That doesn't take into account that they just spent 100 million this year. So already next year, people are thinking, what's going to happen here? They, they're going to have to plea bargain something with UEFA. Um, and 
a lot of these signings happen and they're trying to get the wage bill down. So the star player, Paolo Dybala, they say, Paolo, can you go to Saudi Arabia, please? We've we've found a club for you. Just do it. Paolo's like, no, I love being in Rome. Just got married here. Um, and the fans show up outside of Paolo Dybala's house. Thank you for staying, Paolo. Uh, don't do what the club tells you to do. Brilliant. You're a Roma man. Um, it's a kid who comes through the academy, Nikola Zaleski, plays for Poland, but he's born and raised in Tivoli. And uh, he refuses to go to Galatasaray. Uh, fans aren't too bothered about that, but he's frozen out the squad. Um, and then the defence that they tried to sort of sort out in the transfer window, uh, it doesn't get sorted until the window's closed when they sign Matt Hummels and Mario Hermosa on free transfers after the window's uh, deadline day is shut. So if you look at that, you've given Daniel De Rossi, club legend, three-year deal. Signings don't arrive until after the transfer window's closed and then you sack him. Um, after the first game of the transfer window. And so, yeah, nine months ago, they were most popular owners in in, in Italy. Um, now, I think it'll be very hard for them to step foot in Rome again. And that statement um, that they put out um, on the back of the you know, sort of Everton agreement mm -hmm. pending approval from the Premier League about this multi-club sy symbiosis, um, but we run these clubs independently of each other. Doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, this is like Udinese Watford times by a hundred, because like you know Udinese fans um, grateful to the Pozzo family, locals, because twenty five years in Serie A, you got us into the Champions League. Okay, it sucks that you know in the past Alexis Sanchez would come to us. Now Richarlison's going to Watford first. That sucks. Roma, uh, uh, the, yeah, th there might be one protest in 25 years at Udinese. Roma, they're outside the training ground. They're saying, where's the CEO? Bring her out here now. We need to have a discussion. Where are those owners? Why have they fly flown out? We're not coming into the stadium until half an hour after kickoff to show our discontent. Um, we we're going to go back to our naughty, hostile ways. And so... It's a very difficult situation the Freakins find themselves in. And I think it's just a very interesting run of event over the last week that sack the club legend, uh, CEO resigns on the Sunday, takeover approval on the Monday. Um, it just feels like whatever they said in that statement, it feels like they're getting out of Rome. Um, and, you know, I mean, Matt can speak to you more about the family fortune but mm -hmm. to run these two clubs simultaneously given all the operating costs that they've had you know they've got a stadium project going on in rome i mean this is the sort of thing that like qatar or saudi might be able to pull off but like a mm -hmm. you know titan of industry you know this is something that silvio berlusconi said like he he was getting out of football because he couldn't compete mm -hmm. with states i think you need state money to do this kind of multi-club symbiosis as they call it. Yeah. I mean, Matt, that's a really good point made by James. Um, I looked into the Friedkin group. I mean, from cars to production companies to luxury hotels, I mean, you name it, they've got a lot under their under their belt but how on earth are they, are they affording this? Where is the money coming from? James talks about state size kind of funds but where will they be getting the money for for, for this acquisition? Well, well, it's their own company. So the Friedkin group is an interesting you know, interesting entity in its in its own right. Um, it was started by Dan's father Thomas, uh, who was a stuntman, um, but also quite a clever bloke. Uh, mm. I'm not saying that stuntmen are thick, but you know, they, do, they, do, they do they do they do they do daft things. Uh, um, <laughs> Disclaimer: Now stuntmen yeah. aren't thick. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, he obviously obviously had something going on because he he got into cars, he got into car dealerships in a very big way. So now that makes me sort of think of non-league football here. But no, this is huge. They have the franchise to sell Toyotas and Lexus. Lexi, that's a Anna Partridge joke, isn't it? <laughs> yes. um, yeah, it is. I won't do it again. Um, across about five or six, half a dozen, I think it is, uh, uh, US states. They've also you know, been branching out. I believe they've got a few other little Toyota uh, deals going on as well. They, um, they built a big plant, actually, a couple of years ago, where they sort of uh, assemble, well, they put the finishing touches to Toyotas, uh, for when you order them, so um, you know they they are they have a very close relationship with Toyota. They sell a lot of Toyotas for Toyota, 
I think they're one of the two biggest private dealerships in the world. So huge money. That That is basically the freaking group. It's called Gulf States uh, Toyota. Yeah, that's, that was the that was the original Thomas Freakin business. Now his son Dan, who you know we are ostensibly talking about, you know, is that is a billionaire in his own right. He's in you know, if you look at Forbes and the Bloomberg lists, I think they have about six billion. He's one of the top four five hundred richest people in the world. So we're talking about a, a very rich guy. Um, the Freakin Group under Dan and his sons who I think we're going to get to know. Uh, one in particular, Ryan, is the football guy. Uh, football and films is, is, is his big interest. Um, now, that sort of stunt thing has kind of run through the family. Dan, as everybody knows, surely, uh, is a one of the, one of the, the very few uh, guys that can sort of fly spitfires and hurricanes and things like that in films. He did it it's in, in Dunkirk. Uh, that's not Tom Hardy doing that, landing that spitfire on the beach. That was Dan Freakin. Mm-hmm. And he did, he's done some remarkable things. Like, didn't he go? Didn't he fly Mourinho in personally? Did it with uh, when Alden? Yeah, was he, he he flew in Lukaku as yeah. well. Uh, where he went to London to do the deal with Bid Adikbali and uh, Todd Bowley. Then flew to Brussels, I think, to pick up Lukaku. Love it. And then flew flew to Rome. Um, and you know, um, people who parked their cars at the airport in Rome were furious. Because so many fans had come to to, to see this that did he buzz them first? Yeah, buzz the tower. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Now they're just showing off. Keep going. Well, he's so so he's that sort of guy. So, um, but anyway, so they've gone into films. They've got a, um, a pretty pretty successful in terms of winning winning prizes. Mm. I, I'm not sure how much money it's making because it's all a bit arty stuff. But you know, Parasite. I've mentioned Dunkirk. Uh, was it Killers of the Flower Moon? Well, I always get this wrong. Flowers of Leonardo the Cap- DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah, that one. Leonardo DiCaprio um, one. Yeah. Yeah. So they 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 bankrolled that. Uh, they've really got into golf resorts and high-end tourism. Um, they own a lot of Tanzania, like millions of acres of Tanzania. They're into they're into conservation and again that kind of um, you know sort of tourism angle. So they're, they're an interesting bunch. I I would suggest though that it's basically selling Toyotas is the bit that's making the money. Um, and this this football stuff is it sounds like fun and it, running, owning football clubs is fun. But they, it's expensive, and they've bought two pretty expensive clubs who um, lose money. One ha- has just built a very ex- expensive stadium, which is great, which is the reason the Freakins are there. Um, it's got a little bit of work to do, but not much more, 50 million or so just to fit it out. Um, and the and the building in the Eternal City, you know, good luck. I mean, people have been trying to do that for thousands of years. It's very hard to build in Italy with all the bureaucracy. It's even harder to build in Rome with all the antiquity. So, um, you know, that's 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 a real project, that one. Um, James, Sir James, I think we should all uh, refer, to, refer, to, refer to James. At ease, at ease. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. refer, to, refer to this rumour that will not go away, um, mm. that they are trying to sell Roma. Now, they have denied this. They've denied this pretty much on the record on, on Monday evening with their statement, but they also privately deny it. Now, uh, last year, I kept hearing that they were going to sell it to the Saudis. <laughs> now, there were lots of clues. One, I think there was various <laughs> sponsorship agreements. They were playing in Saudi Arabia. Were they, but they, weren't they sponsored by was it the Riyadh season, which, of course, we've just had in... in mm. uh, yeah, which was, yeah, was, was a big problem uh, in Rome because um, in Italy, the Expo is a big thing. Oh, yes. You know? And uh, Rome was going to host the Expo. Uh, basically, this is where, you know, Every country has its own pavilion. They, you know, you host it in a city, mm. and you get to see the best of what countries have to offer. And Rome was going against Riyadh, and at this time, Rome decided to announce a shirt agreement with Riyadh season, um, which um, mm. which is one of the things. And then more recently, they've become the first team, I think, to sign a player out of Saudi Arabia who's not a disgruntled former Premier League La Liga <laughs> player, but is actually a Saudi international player who is a right back. Um, who Roberto Mancini's just had dinner with in Rome, and people are looking at that and thinking, "What the hell is going on here? Like, why are they signing this guy?" Okay, so anyway, so let's 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 rush forward. Uh, they they're not going to do that apparently, and I I also think that maybe Saudi Arabia has is going to take a bit of a pause on buying clubs for a bit, but that's a subject for another podcast. Um, so that's what they are. They how they're funding it, you know, they're rich, and they've they've mm. already proven that they're willing to throw money at football clubs. Look. 
billionaires don't stay billionaires they become billionaires by spending all their own money of course and i think there will be some borrowing some clever borrowing don't be frightened of borrowing uh it will be secured it'll be on the stadium um it will be low in lower interest than they were paying people like rights of media and triple seven so you know they're going to be sensible um but yeah you know i i think i think they have a plan It, it's been patchy in its delivery in Rome. Let's hope they've learned something. But um, they, they, look, the reason they have been looking at Premier League clubs is that like all Americans, they're like, mm, if we're going to be in football, we kind of need to be in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that Ryan the Sun, he has an office in London. I think he has a place in London. He basically bases himself, as far as I can tell, quite a lot in London. Their football operations <clears throat> are going to be run out of London. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, Sir James, I think we're going to have to let you leave right now um, because Paddy is still part of this conversation. He's been very, very quiet enough to hear his thoughts on everything you've <laughs> dropped on us. So, James Horncastle, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Have a good day, guys. Paddy, let's come to you. I mean, we've covered a lot there about who these people are and what they might want to do with football clubs. We started this podcast with a lot of hope, Everton fans, yes, here we are. After listening to all of this and how they operate, especially with Roma, what are your thoughts on it all? Well, I think there are obviously some warning signs in there, particularly when it comes to the disgruntlement of the, the Roma Ultras, if we're, if we're going to call them that. You do have to remember, though, that this is a very low bar at Everton at the moment. It would be hard mm. to mess this up <laughs> as much as Farhad Mashiri did. Mashiri invested heavily, a little bit like the Freakins have at, yeah. at Roma, but Everton have gone backwards in his seven-ish year tenure. And basically the club and their fans and are on their knees. There's been successive relegation battles, lack of money, lack of finance. Everton are the only side in the Premier League over the last five years to have a positive transfer balance. And you see the result of that on the pitch with, with a pretty threadbare squad in in urgent need of renewal. So anybody that promises to come in and significantly reduce the debt, as the freakins are, but also offers the promise of fresh finance for the football side of the Everton operation, will be welcomed with open arms. And that's inside the club, but it's also among the fan base. So I'd be very surprised if any time soon you saw Everton fans reacting in the way we're seeing from the Roma Ultras right now. I mean, one thing that did prick my ears was what they did with, with uh, Fonseca and bringing in Mourinho. Um, there is a current very good manager at Everton right now, and it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Sean Dyche's job could be something they're looking at if this takeover does happen. Yeah, so they've actually not really given us any indications yet, the three kins, mm -hmm. as to what they think about Sean Dyche, and that's publicly, obviously, but also in mm -hmm. private. The, the honest mm -hmm. answer is we don't know what is going to happen with Sean Dyche as mm -hmm. it stands. The obvious thing to point out as well is that Dyche is into the final year of his deal, as mm -hmm. is the director of football, Kevin Thelwell. So there are some pretty immediate things on the football side of the Everton operation that the Freakins are going to need to get their teeth into and make decisions on. Every time we've asked about Thelwell's future and Dyche's future, we've always been told that this is not the time. There's uncertainty at the club and we can't commit to these big deals and these big decisions while we're going through a, a potential takeover. Mm. So it's only when the Freakins are actually in situ that we will start to see how this unravels. I, I think Thelwell's future is as important as, as Sean Dyche's maybe not quite as symbolic and it's important to the fans, but in terms of the overall structure of the club, the overall, the, 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 the director of football tends to be the symbol of permanence, the one that brings everything together, that the manager should report to the director of football in, in this Everton structure. So I think resolving his future is as important as Dyche's. So we'll see how it goes. Obviously now we've got this Really interesting period where the Freakins have agreed a deal, but they're going through mm. regulatory approval. They're not yet the, the the incumbents at Everton. And they will be keeping a very close eye on just about everything that's going on at Goodison. And I imagine we'll expect to, to see one way or another 
a sharp upturn in, in fortunes over the coming season. Everton have to remain a Premier League club. And if Sean Dyson shows that and gets them beyond that, then obviously that that, that would be kind of positive for him. Um, people at the club right now like Dyche, but we don't know what the Freakins will make of him. Mm, um, Matt, I just want to sort of wrap this up and bring back a name that we sort of started with, um, John Texter. Um, we spoke about his interest in in buying Everton, public interest, I should say. Um, where does this leave him now? Um, and and the conversations around Crystal Palace. Yeah, he's in a he's in a tough spot. Um, I'm afraid. Um, look, he um, he really believed uh, he could do this. That that was sincere when he said, you know, I've, I think I've got a better ninety percent chance. He mm. he he did mean that. Um, I spoke to him a lot that week, and and over the weekend before, he kind of so publicly and so it surprised me in how public he was in in in, in coming out. I think I think that was a mistake. I think you know when he sort of said things like it would be like um, being president of the United States, or it's like kind of driving past the White House and imagining that I'd live in there one day because. Whilst that sounds good coming out, it, it it just John Texter is a multi-club devotee. He he mm -hmm. sincerely believes that it's a business model for football that works. It is kind of still a bit of an unproven thesis. Everyone can point to the fact that City Football Group own lots of clubs, and some of them are really successful. Red Bull's the other probably good example, but both of those entities in their own ways have put absolute fortunes into it. I think probably Red Bull have probably had a better return on investment so far. City Football Group, very patient money, sovereign money, basically. You know, they're going to wait 20, 30 years and they'll say, yeah, look, we're in all the right places. We've made all these wonderful strategic decisions and look how far we've come. We shall see, right? Everyone else that's doing it, it it's just more headaches. You know, running one club is hard and expensive. Running four or five is, is well, it's 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 it's, more, it's worse than five times. It's like, oh my God, you know, just your, the headaches seem to pile up. So, um Texter's got this very complicated situation in that he owns lots of Fogo, which is very much the star of his mm -hmm. little portfolio. They are currently top of the Brazilian league. It's a truly good story. It's a truly impressive story. He was a pioneer in Brazil. He was one of the first external investors to go there, take advantage of a sort of slight change in rules about bringing in external investment in. He's had some. He's had some difficulties. He's made. He's made some um, waves down there. You know, his his boss Fogo kind of collapsed. Uh, they were going to win it last year and they had a you know absolutely appalling finish he's made all these allegations about match fixing that's all kind of playing out you know he's obviously upset a few people but this year he doubled down on the investment they broke the transfer record i think a couple of times in the summer and they are flying leon is the other big one that's the most i suppose the biggest bet he's made so far it's been harder at leon it's been hard he's he, he possibly overpaid um he borrowed money he's got this sort of you know he's got various backers in his group called eagle football that it's it's tough. He also bought this small Belgian team that got relegated. It's a small investment. They're a small team. You know they're currently doing okay in Div Two, and he owns forty five percent of Crystal Palace. Now he mm. didn't want to own forty five percent of Crystal Palace. He wanted to own Crystal Palace, and he kind of I think misinterpreted the signals coming in. He's got kind of stuck on this big minority position. He only has twenty five percent of the vote just because of the, their, their shareholder agreement, and the most important guy there is still Steve Parish, and Steve Parish doesn't want to play ball. With the multi-club idea so he is stuck he wants to float eagle football on um, the york stock exchange he's been completely honest about that completely transparent but i'm not sure he can do it even with palace in there he needs to sell his palace stake he's trying his best um he talked to me about it about a year ago he talked to our, our colleague matt woosnan the crystal palace beat reporter uh six months ago He's got this process running. You know, we shall see. We shall see. He wants quite a big number for it, and he's not going to get the premium. He's going to get a discount because it's, as I said, it's really only twenty five percent of the vote. So look, there's a lot there. He's in a tough spot. I think he's possibly licking his wounds a little bit at the moment. He's he's been he's gone quiet, and I'm not I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Let's see. But look, my 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 the point about his public announcements last week being, I think, unwise, is that before buying Crystal Palace. He went to see Newcastle, Watford. Um, lo this summer alone, whilst talking to Everton, he made a big pitch for for QPR. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, but it just I think it makes it very hard for him the next time he pops up to say, "I love your club." Mm. 
you know, he's 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 going to come across as ridiculous. Um, so I think that's another potential headache for him. But anyway, look, he's 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 not going to be um, the next side of Everton. So we should prop, perhaps stop talking about him in this context and just and just wish him well with his venture because, like I said, um, Botafogo is going well. Hmm. I, I might just, if you don't mind, just talk about him very briefly because I just realised that um, Everton take on oh, Crystal yeah, Palace <laughs> in their next match, Paddy. C can we see a situation where we're looking at Mashiri Texter <laughs> and the Freed kids in the same ground at the same time? That could be quite awkward, putting it in light of recent <laughs> developments. So I, I think most sensible people would try to avoid that scenario are billionaires so, sensible though i mean that's the big question um, right you, not they haven't been at everton i, I can't speak for <laughs> other clubs but but certainly the one at everton hasn't been that sensible um i mean farhad mashiri's not attended a game mm. at everton in a long time i think it's one since rafa benitez's tenure and even that was to pay tribute to his, his friend and the former everton chairman mm. bill kenwright so i wouldn't expect to see him at goodison anytime soon he's not particularly popular a little bit more popular after this decision, maybe, but but not particularly popular. What John Texter does, I think, is is anyone's guess. Um, and I think the Freakins actually will try and keep a pretty low profile. Everything we're hearing is that actually they, they just want to get this done. They don't want mm -hmm. to promise too much while they are in this regulatory approvals process. And then the big proclamations will probably come later on, the, the flowery statements and everything else that, we, that we've seen with Roma. Mm. Okay, brilliant, gents. Honestly, let's leave it there. Really appreciate your time, Matt, Paddy, and James as well. And if you're enjoying the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.